So now we'll jump back into the handshake. And Actually, we'll just... one really quick question. Some of the fields have like, you know, YAML identifiers for exporting and some don't. Is that like on purpose? Yeah. So I believe you're talking about like here, client ID does and versions doesn't. Yeah. yeah. So the convention is that um, by default, I think GoGo Proto does camel case. Um, so that way, when if it, since it does by default camel case, you end up with, um, when you have this separation, you end up with the, the wrong thing. But right. when you have just one word, it ends up being fine because it never does the camel case. Oh, so we okay. use the YAML to specify that. But one interesting port, point is that this never occurs in query. Um, we copied this from the SDK. So I don't know why you don't need any YAML in query. It might be because of the gRPC gateway like generates everything correctly. Um, but query.proto, we don't need to worry about the YAML as cool. a small side note. Cool. These are all great questions. So now we're going to look at the connection open in it. For the most part, it is structured very similar to the spec. Um, and I don't have the spec up, sorry, but you can take a look at that later if you would like. But the open in it is mostly just about kind of doing this hello, identifying who we're actually trying to talk to and figuring out what version we want to do. And so if I just zoom out a little bit, we can actually start by where the entry point to this is. So in the SDK, if you don't know, you send messages to the SDK in order to cause some sort of state change to occur. So we have a message connection open in it defined, um, which has some information that a relayer can fill in and send to the chain in order to start this connection open in it. So it will specify the client ID, that it wants associated with the connection, the counterparty that it wants to connect to, the proposed version, the delay period, and then the signer is just the relayer. But this message will be passed to the message server, which is in the IBC modules top level. So if we go to message server, we will see here open in it. And that just takes the open in it message and it passes it to the uh, connection keeper, which will jump right into this handshake function. So now I am back in O3 connection and I'm in the keeper and I'm in this handshake.go file. So the entry point there is relayer constructs this message, connection open in it, hands it to the SDK, which uses its message server, which routes it to the IBC core module and the core module routes it to the sub module O3 connection. So now we have the arguments provided, the client ID that will be associated with this connection, the counterparty, and the version. Those are the main ones we want to look at. So we actually start by just getting our compatible versions. And if we jump into this function, that just returns our default IBC version, which I said before is just an identifier of one and the ordered and unordered channels as our two features that we support. Where is the client ID generated? The client ID, the client ID is generated at the O2 client. You should have seen that with Aditya last yeah. week. So when I go into Keeper here and I go into Create Client, the client ID is actually generated here. Oh, right. True. So each Tendermint client that is created for some sort of chain has an associated client identifier. And all of this is done well before the connection handshake starts. So now when the relayer wants to create a new connection, it is passing in the client ID of an existing client. And it's saying, I want to create a connection associated with this client, which is basically saying um, who you're trying to talk to, right? Because if you pick a client that's representing osmosis, that would be different than picking a client that represents Akash, you're kind of specifying the connection information already. Um, so going back to the version, we by default use our default version if the relayer passed in a nil version. 
Otherwise, we check to see the version that they propose is supported. If it's not, we return an error. If it is supported, then we set that version in our connection. So here on the open init, we're generating a new connection identifier. So just in the same way we generated a client identifier on create client, on open in it, we generate a new connection identifier. And the way this is done is just by, we keep a basically a global non-stored in the connection keeper for all of the nonces used for connections. It's basically just a nonce that we increment every time we generate a new connection and it begins from zero. So we get basically what the current value is. We assign, create this new connection ID and then we increment it and set it in the store. Sorry, can you, can you um, one second repeat that again? So uh, for every connection, we increment uh, the counter, right? Uh, the connection sequence for every yeah. connection that we create. So we, we always we always keep in our store the next yeah. connection sequence that should be used. Yeah, okay. When we want to generate a new connection identifier, we get that value. We format the identifier with that sequence, which is what we'll return back. And basically we've generated a connection identifier at that point. Mm -hmm. But then we need to increment this con next connection sequence, basically just doing plus plus on it and mm -hmm. update it in the store. Okay. So, so this is the IBC stored that you mentioned before, and 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 this value is stored in a certain key uh, of that value store, right? Correct. So here you can see that we use the uh, key next connection sequence, and we go ahead and marshal that sequence into a byte, and we just keep that stored. And the next connection sequence is just that string right there. Okay. Ooh. We don't allow concurrent writing to the star. Uh, what if two connections and they're all increasing the sequence and then would it be like- I don't think the SDK allows concurrent writes at all right now. I think that okay. would break the how the SDK is structured. Okay. Because I believe everything has to be um, in a, everything has to be in a certain order just for the app hash to match, right? Because that's gonna mm -hmm. affect how the, uh, the final proof is constructed. Yeah. Okay. Is there a like verification check that the client ID provided to initialize the connection actually exists before setting the connection end in state? So um, that is a good question. The I think it would fail here. Uh, okay. Can, add connection to client, where it gets the client state based on the cl client ID. This was actually, I think, something from our internal audit that we did on the core is that we thought we should move this function up earlier since it's actually doing validation. Because it's a little yeah. weird to set the connection in state and then do further validation. But this is correct technically because anytime you return an error on um, application state changes in the SDK, the entire state changes all get reverted. I see. Yeah. So because we return an error here, this set connection gets reverted. So you don't have to worry about partial state changes. I see. I see. Is that, does that hold true for any of these handshake callbacks? Yes. So, so anytime it's, it's true for any time you deliver a message. Okay. Right. So oh, from start so to finish. That's just like using the cache context probably at a lower level somewhere. Yeah. Basically what happens is the base app in the SDK, it takes this message, it caches the context, it tries to basically run this message through the message server. If an error is returned, it dumps the, the cache context and it just, uh, it just marks the transaction as failed and consumes the gas. If it's successful, then it writes the, the context to state and does all the state changes there. Cool. And it's important to note that all messages in a transaction must succeed um, in order right. for those state changes to occur. Cool. Thanks. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Cool. But so, that was a great question. So, so the set connection here is actually not changing the state yet, uh, right? Um, it's changing the state in the cached context. The, yeah. But the, the state changes are finally being written yeah. later if no error is returned. Yeah, okay. Usually we don't do these like 
big state changes like set connection until the very end because it's just easier to read that way because then you don't have to think about like why is this check happening after um, but yeah that's like a knit that could still be addressed cool um, how do people feel about that open in it any questions can you go to the add connection to client uh, for a second? Uh, yes. What happens there? So this is the uh, step where we basically want to um, allow for more efficient queries of the connections associated with the client. So here we're actually just um, getting the client state, making sure it exists. This is really a check that probably should just be um, removed and moved elsewhere. But then basically we're getting the existing connections associated with a certain client. And then we're appending our connection ID. And then we're updating that. So in uh, to say it again, this is just tracking all of the connections associated with a certain client. Mm -hmm. Typically, you wouldn't have multiple connections with the same client unless you have multiple versions. So if you had IBC protocol one, IBC protocol two, there might be other use cases, like if you have different delay periods. But in general, right now, there should really only be one connection per client. Cool. This is a little bit of a side question, but could you remind me again, like the steps involved in like a, a light client attack? A light client attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a light client attack is basically being able to trick the light client into accepting something that is invalid and updating to something that is invalid. So um, let's you can do this in some cases with just one, just a bit over one third of a validator set. So let's say one third of the validator set goes malicious. They want to attack this light client. So they construct this new block that only they signed over. They construct this specific hash that contains some fake information about the state, such as minting, uh, such as moving all of the, like allowing them to un escrow or mint a bunch of tokens from ICS20. And then they update the like client to this value such that now when they send a packet, which says transfer all this fake money into my account, the light client actually processes it and sees it as a valid packet, even though it was produced off of this invalid block. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. If you have more questions about that, let me know. Um, but it is a little bit tangential to connections. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.